So we'll just kick it off. Um, so excited to hear your story. I mean, you sent it to me in an email and so powerful. And I've been so excited to hear, you know, your story on the, the live version. So um, yeah, I'd love to just, you know, start by hearing a little bit about you and then we can just kind of jump into it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I have been um, a licensed psychotherapist for 16 years and uh, I brought my my business online and I'm married my husband. Yeah, I have my I'm married and I have my son and we have a dog and yeah, that's my, <laughs> that's awesome. me. How old is your son? He's three. Oh, awesome. I have a two year old. So oh fun yes yeah. it's such a fun stage it's a hard stage but it's really fun yeah for sure well awesome okay so let's jump into it we can just start at the beginning or wherever you want to start cool okay well so I grew up in the church um, my family was really active um, happy family really involved in the church and um Yeah. And I think it's important um, to my story that I got sexually abused as a child. And I really struggled after that with, with guilt and shame. Like um, in my elementary school years, I uh, was really distracted and felt really stressed in school. I just kind of sat there and sweat (laughs) and it was just kind of stressful. Um, but, um, when I was eight years old, my parents became more aware of how I was handling that and that it was causing me a lot of stress. I wanted to be home. I was calling into, uh, I was calling homesick like almost every day. (laughs) And, um, so my dad gave me a, a father's blessing at that point. And really it helped me so much. It helped me, um, it helped me and I didn't really stress about it as much after that point. So it was a really good thing. Um, but still I felt like it kind of still influenced the way that I thought about myself, like in church and, and I always part of kind of one of the big themes of my story is when it came to the church, even though I, I grew up and I didn't do very well introducing myself, but I grew up in, in Cottonwood Heights, Utah. And that's where I, that's where I live now. I we're in Cottonwood Heights. Um, and the, the, the ward that I grew up in, my family, everybody was, was great, but I just kind of felt dirty and like I had to hide. And I remember as like a teenager, kind of thinking of myself as a this is bizarre language, but kind of thinking of myself as like a slutty child, that word, that language actually crossed my mind. And and how, how bizarre is that to say of an innocent child? Um, so I just felt stressed and uncomfortable in some church lessons. I, I kind of felt like I was a square pig trying to fit into the round hole. That's kind of a big theme of the story. And, um, stressed and uncomfortable and some lessons as a teenager, especially just trying to feel like I, I was, I was a good kid. I was great. I didn't really rebel against the church. I, I did exactly. I followed my parents' rules. I followed church standards. Um, but I just had this kind of this past that I always felt like I needed to hide. And, um, so one lesson that specifically stands out when I was a teenager, because and it this this does not make sense on like a cognitive level why this affected me, but we were learning about the adulteress, the adulteress that was thrust before Christ, and then of course, what does Christ say? Like he that ha- he without sin can cast the first stone, and so the story is so beautiful and so merciful and so accepting. But I felt really stressed during that story. I felt like she was vulnerable and being, she was in a vulnerable situation and she was being exposed to everybody, including Christ and how, how awful that would be for her. And yeah, and it was also felt unjust because where was the man? Like the man is not in this story. It's the adulteress, you know? Uh, So, so yeah, so that's kind of a background there. Um, 
really happy childhood overall. Great family. I'm the oldest of four. So I have two younger brothers and one younger sister. Really love my, my family of origin. Um, after this, I went to uh, BYU Hawaii. And so did high school, you know, played the part, obeyed the rules, kind of felt like I was always wearing a mask in a way. Um, but after that, I went to BYU Hawaii and I was really happy there. I actually, it was a good time of spiritual growth for me. I, I made great friends. I felt um, that things were really working out there. And then out of, out of nowhere, all of a sudden I was diagnosed with cancer. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it kind of took me away from this wonderful place where I finally felt like I actually fit in, which, which, which was weird. Like anyone from my, from my youth or anyone who knows me growing up probably didn't pinpoint say like, she never felt like she fit in. It's just not really how I presented. Um, but that was, certainly the case and nobody knew my story I did not start sharing my story about the sexual abuse and all of that until I was older um so anyway spirit spiritual growth good things at Hawaii got the cancer had to come home to Salt Lake City Cottonwood Heights area to um be cared for with my with my parents um and family and in that moment my childhood was gone in an instant and that was another really spiritual time for me. My, again, my father, my dad, I'm really close to my dad. I know you're close to your dad too. I yeah. love that episode. Yes. Um, so he gave me, and I'm really close to both my parents, my mom as well, yeah. <laughs> my mom and my dad. Um, but he gave me a blessing with my bishop and was, I was blessed right at the beginning, you know, right when I was diagnosed, I thought, oh, I'm going to die. This is a death sentence. And, and I got this amazing blessing for a full recovery. And so that gave me the faith and hope through that experience. I had incredible experiences where I felt family members on the other side of the veil. They felt really close to me. They felt um, like I could touch them. Like I, I did not try to touch them, but I, I felt like they were there. Like I could, they were tangible to me. Like they were comforting. And I felt, I felt their presence. And yeah, I, but one thing that came from my cancer experience that of course now, and I've had a lot of time to analyze this in my years of being a, a psychotherapist and now an online coach where I've done the inner work around this. And I really developed control issues in that, which is common with trauma, life after trauma, you know, um, I felt like I needed and wanted to control everything around me. And even though that's very impossible, right? Um, so after my cancer experience, it took, you know, a couple of years and then more years to heal. And that I, during this time I went to, I never returned to BYU Hawaii, which was sad for me. That was a, that was a bummer. That was a loss. Um, but I went to graduate school to become a licensed psychotherapist. I did all of that, wanted to help others overcome trauma and kind of right out of the gate, I started special. I wanted to work with people in cancer situations, struggling with loss, struggling with cancer, difficult diagnoses, life after cancer, but I actually started really focusing on sexual trauma. That's kind of where I started and it was really organic. That's where I fell. Um, really, as far as the beginning of my professional career. Um, so at this point, I decided, you know, I, I, I was kind of in a weird place. I was 25 years old. <clears throat> I felt kind of too young to get married. I, I had a really hard time making long-term decisions. I had a, a good friend, a boyfriend who'd been around since high school era at this point. Um, and, but I, I, you know, it was hard. I, I, I felt like I had to go and do something. So I decided to go on a mission. And so I went on a mission. I had a great mission experience. Uh, I loved, I loved it. I saw so many miracles and, um, but again, I had a really hard time feeling out of control, um, stemming from the, the sexual abuse and then the cancer, you know, like feeling out of control is the worst. And lots of people, again, dealing with trauma, life after trauma can understand that. 
So I was actually originally called to serve my mission in El Salvador. Um, but I scared myself in the MTC. I literally scared myself so bad that I started getting physical presentations of my cancer symptoms again. Mm. And so, you know, they sent me to the, they sent me to the doctors. They, <laughs> what ended up happening after this was my, the, the MTC mission president essentially called me in his office, really loving and really nice and said, you know, you can go to El Salvador or you can serve your mission in Florida. And I was like, Florida, I was just, I had scared myself so bad. And, you know, there's a lot of for, folk, I call it folk where they, people just told these scary stories. Um, anyway, but I think it's important to my story that I was so driven and influenced by fear. Fear was a really controlling factor in being in control. So I ended up in Florida. Um, I was in the same area for 15 months because during that time, that's, that's unheard of, by the way, it is unheard of to be in an area for that long when you're serving a mission. 15 months, we had a mission president change and that kind of was why it, it happened the first time. And then again, I was getting really stressed. I had two really difficult companionships at the end of my mission. The last two were really, really hard. And of course, I was a licensed psychotherapist at this point, um, albeit an inexperienced one. Um, and so I felt like I, I had with those last two companionships, um, I had to be, I kind of did a lot of like their, like they, they had special hardships and difficulties on the mission. And I, I kind of like felt like I was caring for them and, and providing therapy, if you will which is, and, and I, and I didn't, I really cared what my mission president thought of me. You know, he would, he would say things like, oh, you're a happy spirit. And you're, you know, I got a lot of praise from him and, and I, that meant a lot to me. So I didn't want to tell him how bad I was struggling. So I really didn't seek for, seek help in this situation. And being in the same area for 15 months and having all this, so I was like, practically a member of the ward at this point. Like I, like these people, I knew them and, um, and my cup was really empty. And at the end of my mission, I had three weeks remaining and, um, I ended up being questioned about a potentially inappropriate connection between myself and one of our recent converts. Um, he was a miracle and it was such a, an incredible story of my mission that he, like, I was like, this is why I didn't go to El Salvador. I came to Florida because of this convert and this, like the people that I've met in connection to this. And um, so it was really hard for me. And I felt like the president was misunderstanding me. And I felt like I was being wrongly accused. And I understand now um, that he was really, my, my mission president was really trying to protect me. He wanted um, to make sure that I was safe. And, and this, this recent convert was, you know, extremely inappropriate, had poor boundaries and not just with myself, but with a lot of the sister missionaries. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, a, it was not a great situation. I felt like I had it all handled. So there was the definite pride thing going on there and um, didn't want to ask for help, wanted to stay in my area. I wanted to finish because I'd been there the whole time. I only had three weeks left. Um, I begged my president to let me stay um, and he refused. And I literally felt broken from this experience. I, I felt like it broke me. I mean, seriously, I, it was so hard for me. And my subjective understanding of this that, at that time was that I was being harshly punished. And I saw it as like a banishment. I was like banished to a new area for the last three weeks. And the reason that I was sent to this particular area is because they had a therapist and my, I was, I wanted to stay so bad. And, and my president had never seen this, this side of me. And I was presenting kind of neurotic and total frank, frankness. Um, so he sent me to get some professional help on my mission for those last three weeks. And I felt so judged. I felt like my whole mission was judging me. Now the ward, the area was judging me. Um, I just felt like they all saw me as being like bad. I all of a sudden was just bad, which, which 
is not the case at all. And anytime I tried to explain this story to anyone who had served a mission or been a leader, had a leadership position in a mission, they'd be like, yeah, that's not that big of a deal. Like that happens all the time. I'm like, no, it was a huge deal. Like you don't understand. It was a huge deal. Um, so I resigned to serve those last three weeks, the rest of my mission and just try to survive it. And I felt completely defeated. In my exit interview with my president, he said that he had consulted with the Lord and he knew that I was innocent of any wrongdoing. But at that point, it really didn't matter very much to me what he said. So, um, which I think actually ended up, that's, that's a good thing. I cared too much what other people thought of me. I mean, that was part of my, my downfall. Um, so, so yeah, I, I left my mission not feeling very great about myself. I kind of, I always say that I like limped, I emotionally limped home from my mission and, and it, it was for the most part, such a great experience. So it's sad, but, um, now retrospectively, and since this, I feel like this podcast is so amazing. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, giving this a voice, but I feel like this whole situation for me was, was perfectly orchestrated by the Lord, the exact circumstances to have me fall. I needed to fall because I had been stacking this tower of cards for years and I was going, it was going to fall at some point. And I felt like the Lord helped me have it in a time of my life where it wasn't easy by any means, but where I could learn to let Christ repair me through the atonement. I didn't understand the atonement at that point. Um, but now with even the small human comprehension that I have of our savior and his atonement, I mean, yes, I, I needed to learn that and understand it. That, that was a perfectly orchestrated lesson for me. So after my mission, uh, not feeling great, I tried to re-engage with my singles ward. And I, again, this is kind of a theme for me, but I felt like that square peg trying to force myself into the round hole. And I just didn't feel like I belonged. Um, so I ended up going inactive. And so within the, within a year of getting home, I was, I was inactive. And then shortly after ended up breaking commandments and I felt like I would never be good enough. So I thought, why try so hard and beat myself up so badly if I'm never going to be good enough anyway. And I just, had this perfectionist complex, you know, I'm, I consider myself a, uh, um, I'm a, oh, I'm a recovering perfectionist, you know, like that perfectionism is just, it's, it's not, it's, it's terrible. It's an, it's entitlement and it's ego and it's all these bad things, but wrapped up in the guise of like sheep's clothing. So it just seems like, oh, I'm just trying to be my best self, but it's so self-deprecating. Um, so then I, I fell, like I escaped to a different kind of life than I'd ever known into the party scene. I met and partied with new friends all over the world. At first it was really fun. I actually felt free for the first time. Like for the first time I felt free. I was like, this is, this is great. Why do, why have I learned my whole life that this is so bad? Um, I felt like I was being accepted, like pure and full acceptance at first. And it was only after I'd been in it for a time that I started to see how dark it was, like the dark side. And I was heavily drinking and experiment, like recreational drug use, like socially. And I, you know, drinking causes depression. And for me, recreational drug use was causing huge anxiety. So all of a sudden I was, I was missing my, my childhood. I was missing the values of my childhood. Um, and again, it all creates a dependence, a social dependence, you know, huge dependences on different levels for people who engage. So, and also the social connections that I was making at that time, for the most part, were really like self-serving. It felt like a very selfish scene to me. I, and I think it's also really crucial to note here that I, I never stopped believing in the church. Like I, I just felt like I couldn't do the guilt and the shame anymore. You know, a lot of people yeah, a lot was, of people. Oh, sorry. What? <laughs> I was just going to say, um, 
what you said just barely about missing your childhood, it just really like struck a chord with me because I can relate to that so much. Like I remember when I was in my, um, whole addiction and everything. And I remember seeing a picture of myself as a kid and it breaking my heart to see that picture because I missed my childhood. Like I missed feeling safe and like that at home feeling of, yeah, I don't know, but like, I thought that was really amazing, but anyway, go on. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I would see pictures of my, exactly that, see pictures of myself as a child and see the light in my eyes and be like, why did I judge myself so harshly? Like I was, and it isn't then, now I'm not, but I was then. Yeah. Um, You know, and, and people would try and talk to me about like other, other things like the, the anti doc, the anti information and all that. And honestly, as much as I, I heard that, like that didn't, I was like, okay, Hey, I, I had a testimony of Joseph Smith. I, I didn't, I didn't question that. I was like, you know, if he did all of that and then he's still going to the celestial kingdom, that really only gives me hope. <laughs> I just didn't have the same like reaction as other people do, but yeah. you know, we're all so different. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, it was in the party scene where I met my husband, Ryan and Ryan was always a truth seeker. He, he always, he struggled really, he struggled a lot with substance abuse. And he basically was, was inebriated for over a decade by the time I had met him. And, um, he just, even if at that time, he didn't really want to kick it, but he never really could kick it. Like when stop, I mean, by like, stop, stop doing it. Um, and even though it didn't look perfect between us, like on paper, like when I'm like dating this guy and it's like, why am I dating this guy? But we always had this amazing spiritual connection, to be honest, through, through all of it. We met at the party scene. We met at a Halloween party in 2014 in Park City. And of course, heavy drinking, drug use. This is use. the Park City that I was thinking of. Okay. Yes. 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 This is the Park City. Yeah. So yeah, he grew up in Park City. So um, and so I always had this deep spiritual connection. It's kind of funny because early on in our relationship, uh, I woke up one morning and this is so goofy because I, do you remember the eighties Saturday's warrior movie? Like, I don't know if anyone's seen this. It's really funny. I've heard of it. I don't think I've seen it though. Okay. Well, I only saw it one time and I was like six years old, so I didn't know it and I didn't remember it. And it's not something that I've thought about, but as I was waking up one morning, I just had it come into my mind. Like I I was waking up and I don't know if I was having a dream about it or if it just came in when I was waking up, but like, there's this couple that met in the pre-existence and she was going to a family who was a member and he was going to a family that was in, was non-members and they were in love and they just wanted to find each other. (laughs) I had this, I was like, this is funny, but maybe I knew Ryan. I felt like it was trying to tell me that I like knew Ryan in the pre-existence. I was like, wow, that's okay. Like <laughs> it's kind of a funny, cause I, again, it's such a corny movie, but, um, you know, that, that point that I, that I met him, I knew him, you know, I knew his spirit and, and he meant something to me. And, and that was really, really cool. So we, we lived together. Um, so we met in October. He moved in with me in June of 2015. And so we lived together for a couple of years and got married in June of 2017. And, and it was a hard first year of marriage. You know, we had lots of ups and downs. Ryan always being a truth seeker, he in in school, he studied Eastern religions and thought. And he loved Buddhism. And he loved um, so he really, he really had a great spiritual basis. Um, yeah. So, and we connected on that. Like I, I felt it. And when we were engaged, my, my dad had the impression during conference that he should take me on a trip to the sacred grove. And so I was getting married in June. And so in May, my dad flies me to the sacred grove. Again, this is a time in my life when we were still very deep in partying. Our life was not in in alignment at all with with the church's standards, um, 
I still believed Ryan was spiritual, but you know, we were, we were not living, you know? So I went to the sacred grove with my dad and while sitting in the sacred grove, I had this thought and idea come to my mind, which I now recognize as re revelation that Ryan was going to get baptized in the church. And at the time I was like, no way. Like, this is Ryan. Like, no way. You know, that's, but it, so it seems so unbelievable since our lives were what they were at that time. But the Lord put that thought into my mind and I feel like he was holding my hand and slowly guiding me towards him, like step by step and slowly showing me the possibilities that he has in store. Like nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. Um, so, so we got married and, um, first year of marriage was tough. And so then comes kind of like my, my comeback story. I had my son in 2019 and at that time I was able to have a small glimpse of the love that heavenly father has for us. I just remember looking down at my beautiful, perfect little baby. And I was like, wow, how could I be hard or judge this little perfect babe? Like, is it, you know, like, and those aren't even that, those words I just used aren't even doing justice. What I felt, it was like, I can't ever put him into any like limited limiting beliefs box where he would get stuck. Like that, of course he can do anything. Like, of course God loves him. Of course, you know, it just made some things started making sense to me and looking down at that beautiful little boy. And then came 2020 and Ryan and I both wanted structure for our son in the changing world. You know, we had COVID, we had division, we had the earthquake here, we had fires, droughts, the, the world was changing so fast. Things that I never thought I would see in my lifetime just happened in a month's time. Like it was just crazy, you know? And I was like, oh my gosh, like it really scared me. And I really felt like I really needed structure for my son. And Ryan completely agreed. We needed structure. And I presented that, you know, maybe I should take him to the church. And Ryan said, you know, I think that's a good idea. He'd watched my, my family members, um, who are really active and they, they were great examples to him. And, um, he was like, I think that the structure there is good. And he did clarify and made perfectly <laughs> sure that I knew that he would not be getting baptized. He wouldn't be coming with me either. Like he, he would not be there nor getting baptized, but that I could take James and he thought that would be good structure. Um, and so I started taking James and I, I decided to attend the ward that I grew up in, uh, my parents' ward, because I wanted to go with somebody. I felt scared to go back to church on my own now with a little boy in tow. And plus my boy is really hyperactive and he's awesome. <laughs> he is a handful. I, I love him. Yeah. Okay. You get it. <laughs> um, so and also, as far as I was concerned, I didn't know at this time if I would fully be coming back to the church, to be honest. I still didn't want that. I felt like the shame and the guilt thing. I'm like, I'm, I finally don't feel that. It's not plaguing me. And I feel so as much as I believe in the church, but I just don't know if I can totally dive back in. But I need this for my son. Um, and so, yeah, then. So <laughs> the ward that we attended, the ward we decided to go to, the ward that I grew up in, <laughs> is amazing. Like, it's amazing. I, I don't, I can't, there's no words. So, and at this time when I was coming back, still some of it was being um, broadcast on YouTube, you know, at, at this point, I, it's not for my ward. I don't know elsewhere, but um. So Ryan was kind of watching some Sunday school lessons with me. And sometimes he would watch the sacrament, the sacrament meeting and stuff. And he would say things like, wow, this guy teaching Sunday school, he's really awesome. He does not at all seem like a, you know, like a sheeple. He's not just a follower. He's obviously really intelligent. And quite frankly, the lessons that he's teaching in Sunday school are like motivational life lessons. I think that I could definitely apply this to all parts of my life. I, I like this. So he started coming to church with me in person. Like he just started coming and I was shocked. 
And he would say to me and members that although he would never be baptized and that he was, you know, but he, he would, he would not do that, but he loved learning the teachings. And he really felt like, again, they were applicable to his life (laughs) and just like kind of motivational speeches. (laughs) So the ward family embraced us fully. And at a ward picnic, um, this amazing couple who actually their story kind of resembles mine and now ours, where the guy, the man, the, the guy who really befriended Ryan, he had been inactive for many years. And then he met and fell in love with his wife, who was non-member and they together kind of grew in the church and he came back and she got baptized and they did that. And then this, and then they were getting sealed in the temple around the time that they met us. Um, and so it was really cool. And, and he just really, he befriended Ryan on such a beautiful level. Ryan started asking me questions like, is there some sort of a reward? Like if, if, why is he, why is he my friend? Like, is there like, is there like some sort of like MLN, like pyramid scheme going on here? Like if, if he baptizes me or like, is there like a reward for him? Like, uh, no, not, not like nothing like that. No, (laughs) it's just eternal rewards maybe, but you know, nothing, nothing in this life. Um, he even asked like, do they get like a tithing discount? (laughs) (laughs) It was really funny because he had, again, my, he had no really background in the church. Yeah. Um, but you know, they would come over to our house after we would put our child to bed and he would just share things, talk with us share cool scriptures. And he and Ryan were really on the same like wavelength as far as the way that they think about the world. And, and it was just amazing because like Ryan would have like an idea or a question earlier in the day and we'd be kind of like talking about it. And then later that evening, this guy would come over and like answer it. Like it was just, it was so inspired and it was amazing. Also another couple in the ward had just returned home from serving as mission presidents and they took us both under their wings. And it was amazing. They invited us over to dinner. And again, Ryan's just like, wow, these people are amazing. They're intelligent. They sit here and answer. He was just blown away. Um, Another couple who did this amazing, intelligent couple who, by the way, fast forward, story a little bit, but they're now our next door neighbors. And they're honestly like second parents to us. <laughs> but seriously, it's, it's amazing. So Ryan was being taught the gospel without even realizing that he was being taught the gospel. And he was shown how the gospel works, changes lives and inspires people by the ward members who are actually being like Christ and doing what he teaches in their lives while being instruments in the Lord's hands which I do not think is unique just to our ward. I think that this is, you know, the true desire and goal of so many members out there. Um, I am in awe when I think about this process. So, so we started going to church in the spring of 2021 around Easter and Ryan ended up getting baptized in October of 2021. So last, last year. And it still amazes me. He had one of those amazing spiritual experiences where you know, one night this guy asked him to pray about what he'd been learning or no, no, actually he did not ask him to pray. We read a scripture, the scripture in Alma, where he says like, what have you against being baptized? And I'm going to butcher it if I try and quote any further. But, um, so Ryan was like, Hmm. So then they left that night. They stayed until like 1am, whenever they would come, we would just be talking, talking, talking. And so right after they left, you know, we were kind of talking about it and I, asked him, I'm like, well, what do you have against being baptized? You know, you've been, you've been digging all of this. And he's like, Hmm. So he went outside and, and of course I'm telling his story now, but he went outside and prayed about it. And he like got one of those amazing miraculous answers where he heard an answer on the wind, you know, and, and it was true. And, and he, even though the adversary and the resistance came, he didn't doubt that. And he got baptized. And it was a miracle. It was honestly nothing short of a miracle. And after this, miracles continued, and we were able to buy a house in the ward. The couple that had served as the mission presidents ended up giving us the opportunity to buy their elderly mother's home. Like, well, she she sold it to us. But I mean, it wow. was it, 
like it was never listed on the market. Like we, the, I, an incredible deal. Like it was just amazing. Um, and such a blessing and the people in the ward and the community literally became family rather than just friends. And yeah, the biggest miracle of all, I would have to say last week, we were able to go to the temple and be sealed and be sealed to our little, our little boy. And I'm just still in awe. Like I'm in awe. Like this is, I never, you know, would have thought, you know, and last night when I was talking to Ryan and kind of preparing for this interview, and he said something really interesting as we were discussing this, but he said, you know, you opened the door and I stepped through it. And then together we started running. And as far as like our gospel, (laughs) our gospel, like embracing the gospel and, and it's brought so much joy. It's brought so much joy. Um, of course things are never perfect and the adversary will never stop, but it's just, it's, it's all in God's hands and it's all in God's timing. And yeah, it's just so amazing how God can see the overview and, oh, and Ryan, after he was baptized was finally able to stop drinking and, and smoking weed and doing all of like all the things he just was able to just, he changed like the change of heart is real. It's so, it's so real. I, it's funny and interesting that you, you bring that part up because in my personal story, um, you know, I went to rehab and all, all that. And then the real hard part was the quitting smoking and the coffee that was like my every single day routine. And because like heroin destroys your life. So it's like, you have to either choose to live or die when you're doing heroin, but cigarettes and coffee and, you know, not living a chaste life, I guess you could say all of those things, they kind of there, it's like part of your lifestyle and it's not like it's going to immediately kill you. You know what I mean? Like it's, so those things are really, really hard to give up. And, um, I had a similar experience to Ryan that, you know, I, I was like, I'm going to try this and I'm going to take that chance. And the the ability to quit those things is so incredibly, you can't deny the enabling power of the savior's atonement, helping you to quit these things because it's so it's, it's just, I'm sure he probably, you know, was just like, wow, like I I have this power. That's not of myself, (laughs) you know? Yes. Yes. So uh, no, watching, yeah. watching him has been amazing. Yeah. And uh, the, hearing your story. I mean, yes. So amazing. Um, so, so kind of my main like takeaways from this whole experience was like, first of all, that square peg trying to fit into a round hole. That is a big fat lie that and identity, our identity as children of God. Of course, we're all misfits. We, every single one of us, we are myth misfits. That's what we are. The, we all need Christ. No one is the same. There is no perfect, perfect member out there. There just doesn't exist. It's a story. It's a narrative that we tell ourselves it becomes an excuse. It became an excuse for me. It really did. And I own that now, but we all belong with Christ. Mm-hmm. and. Second of all, there's a difference between guilt and shame. You know, guilt can be good as it encourages healthy changes, healthy changes in our lives. Uh, Shame is a tool used by the adversary. Shame deters us. And it's more of like an external thing. Like it's, it's about what others think of us. You know, it's, we can shame ourselves, but it usually has to do with some sort of external criteria. And while guilt is more of like an internal motivating process that helps us learn and grow, you know, guilt helps us learn and grow. And that's why we're here. You know, we're not necessarily here for it to be easy, Well, we're for sure not here for it to be easy. Right. And we need to grow. And then last of all that I, my takeaway is that Christ is always there waiting for us. Always. He never gives up on us. 
in the dark times and in the low times, especially like he is there. He's just waiting for us to turn our faces towards him. You know, um, I experienced that and can testify of the deep and incredible love that he has for us. We can always turn back to him and he will save us. His love is infinite. We don't even have the capacity to understand it right now. So I love that. It's been a- <laughs> so I, I have a question for you. You mentioned that when you were on your mission and, you know, kind of in your earlier years, you were so like fear just like paralyzed you. And yeah. I can relate with that feeling a lot. Um, not so much anymore, but, um, just fear of like messing up or fear of what other people think. And yeah. I'm curious to know, like what, what you did to kind of overcome that and like how, what some of the, it's, it's interesting because every once in a while it will like come up for me, like, it, especially at work, like when I'm at work and something happens, like one of my customers is upset with me or like something like that. It, I have that fear that like really takes over. And it's interesting because I can share about my heroin addiction with the entire world. And I'm like, Meh, whatever. But like, if I feel like one of my customers is mad at me, like it is the end of the world. So, I mean, I think that a lot of people have a similar struggle with fearing what other people think, fearing about hard situations or, you know, just dealing with perfectionism. Like you said, what, what advice would you have for somebody that's kind of learning to overcome that or, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, fear is of the adversary. Faith is of Christ. I think that identity, identity, we are children of God. Like we can handle anything. Understanding our, our, like our identity and having a purpose that's greater than just us. Um, you know, I've done the, the nitty gritty of this is like journaling, you know, inner work is a process. Journaling can be very helpful, but prayer, first of all, so, so first of all, it takes a certain amount of, of self-awareness, you know, um, which, you know, we, we do have, but then it's like, what, what do you do with it then? Like you, you're paralyzed in fear of what other people think of you. Um, so, so praying to overcome that, praying to see yourself the way that God sees you. I mean, for me and my journey, that was, that was the answer, you know, falling away and having this whole card tower that I'd been stacking this mask that I was trying, like, this is how I want you to see me. Of course, that didn't come across as authentic. You know, people were probably always seeing through it, but I felt like I was doing a pretty good job of maintaining this. But um, seeing ourselves as he sees us, you know, putting back together those, the, the broken pieces, like when we feel defeated or we feel like someone's judging us or we feel like at work or even like a small situation, like someone's mad at you. Like, first of all, that can be on them. I mean, we can, we can let people own their stuff and then we can own our stuff. But I would say the overarching answer to that is, is identity and, and seeing ourselves as actual and literal children of God, which is so powerful. Yeah. It's the best identity there is. It's so true. I love that so, so much. Um, okay. I have a couple other questions for you that are from listeners. Um, what, how do you deal with hard questions in the church? How do you face those questions and, um, face them with faith? Hard questions. Um, maybe church history questions or, um, you know, just something hard questions in the church that we maybe don't have answers to, or things that you personally don't have answers to or and whatnot. Like, how do you face those? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm of the mindset that I understand that I'm not going to have all the answers in this life, but I lean into those, the core basics, you know, am I praying? Am I asking God? Am I leaning into the scriptures? Am I doing the little things? The little things matter. Um, 
I'm not going to know all of the answers to all of the tough questions in this life, but I can tell you that rather than like just rely fully on my intellect and try and figure it out, I lean into my emotions and I'm that type of person that I'm going to trust. Like, like, even if my brain tells me that something is a hundred percent safe, like, oh yeah, sure. Walk down this, this alleyway. It's the middle of the day. There's tons of people around. It's going to be perfectly fine. But if my gut, if my emotions tell me don't walk down that alley, like there's something there, you know, like regardless of what my intellect will say, like, I trust my feelings. I trust it. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that with these tough questions too. It's like, like this joy that we were talking about as children, like the light and being raised in the church, the structure, all of these systems that high achievers out in the world, they create their structures and their systems. Like they just do that naturally. And that's how they become the high achievers. Um, they might not all be the best systems and structures, but the church gives us that and we are raised with it. And I took it for granted, you know, but I think again, so just kind of leaning into the, they call it the primary questions versus the secondary questions. Yep. I, um, uh, stand for some or stand forever by yeah. Elder Burbridge. Yes. That's yes. A good talk. I love that one. Yeah. So leaning into the primary questions and then really leaning into how it makes you feel. So many people that I talk to nowadays, um, you know, kind of want to disregard their, their feelings. And people have talked about that here on your podcast. Yeah. Um, but truly, I mean, we have our strong, our intuition, our feelings for a reason. And if we, don't, if we can't like trust our feelings, what is like, what is this life all about? Like, right. What? And what quite all me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Purpose, the meaning. That's all that it's about. And as a therapist, teaching people to work, like lean into their emotions in any situation. I mean, it's just a go-to, like, of course we have to do that. that that's what therapy is about, you know? Yes. Um, that is such a good valid point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leaning into the eye of the storm and there's a peace and a calm there, like facing it, you know, the, I mean, that's in hard emotions, but, but there's, there's so much beauty and value to leaning into our emotions. Absolutely. Oh man, that is good. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what advice do you have for people who are unsure the church is true? Mm. Well, for people who are unsure that the church is true, I would say, well, depending on where, where you're at with that, I mean, pray about it. I I've always been able, I've had the, the, I guess, benefit in my life of kind of always believing that it was true. Like that wasn't really my problem, but watching my husband and watching his process and watching him pray and seek answers and really listen and receive answers. That's another big part of it. But yeah, I think that if, if you are in a situation where you are wondering if the church is true and pray, God is always there for us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, I love that. I think that, um, you know, recently I had a conversation with, um, a group of people who did a big study on, you know, what leads back to not only our church, but other churches and what, what was it that really helped them come back? And it starts with a prayer and it starts with talking to God. And it's interesting how, you know, sometimes when we've had that distance and we just like give like this much effort and just a teeny tiny bit of effort, like, you know what, I'm going to be willing to pray. And like, I'm just going to like reach out just a little bit and just see like, if he reaches back. And I found in those moments that, you know, for me, it was, it was finding a book of Mormon bookmark in this like random Bible in Fresno, California, in a rehab where I was the only member of the church. Like these little gifts and tender mercies from God saying like, Hey, like it, you're reaching for me a little bit. Like I'm going to reach back and I'm going to be there for you. And I think that's kind of a common theme with prayer. And so I'm so like, I love that you said that. So, yeah. um, okay. So one last question for you. 
how can a parent help a child who is away? Like in your situation and you're going through all of your stuff, your family remains super strong in the church. Um, you know, how did they interact with you? What, is there anything they could have done to help bring you back? Um, did they try to like, what was that like? Yeah. The best thing that a parent could ever do for their child is to love them, love and love and love and love. In my case, um, yeah, I mean, it, it broke my, I know that I, I broke my mother's heart, you know, like I was always like, I, I again, cared what they thought about me. I, they were so broken when I, when I left the church and, and my, my two brothers have always remained really active, but my sister has not, she's had her own journey. Um, but my mom just prays and my dad prays. And, and also he would always be there. Like, I remember when I first had my son and I was having my, my, my process with that. And I all of a sudden realized that I wasn't sealed to my son. And I called my dad. He was always the go-to that I would call and ask questions. And I said, dad, are, are you, since I'm sealed to you, are you sealed to my son? Like, are you sealed to James? Like, is he sealed to you? And I can't even remember the answer that my dad gave me, but he always gave me comforting, reassuring answers when I brought, and maybe everybody's not going to be concerned about that particular question. But for me, my parents have always been there. You know, they don't act any different when I was, when I was in my journey and with my sister, they don't act any different with us that they did with my brothers who always were very active and stayed faithful. Um, they just loved us. They, I mean, and that's what Christ teaches, right? That's what it's all about. It's loving. We can't control what people's journeys are going to be. We don't know what's going to happen. But if there's anything that I have learned through this journey, it's that Christ had, Heavenly Father had a plan for me. I couldn't always see that plan. I couldn't see it. My parents surely couldn't see it, you know, but he had a plan and he did. He, he took my hand and he guided me back step by step. And he was always there. He was there, you know, and, it's, and so it's, having it's, faith. He took all the things that you went through and it's like, looking back now, it just shaped you into being yeah. like who you are today. And yeah. Isn't it interesting how God can work all things to the good of those who love him? Amen. Yes. <laughs> well, awesome. We are just about out of time, but this was so perfect and just amazing. And I am so grateful that you came on the podcast because you have a beautiful story. And I just, what an honor to have you on my podcast. So thank you. It's such an honor to be here again. This is such an amazing platform for people to be able to come in and I mean, these are, these are soul things, heart and soul things. And, and to have a place to come and, and talk about it. And then I listen to your podcast, like I said, and it's just inspiring, you know, it's amazing. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Yes. Thank you so much. You are awesome.